Hi, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of The Biz, the Business Integrity School. I'm Cindy Morin, the founder and executive chair, and we have with us today a very special guest as we continue our discussion on tech ethics. We have with us Hal Daume, and he has a very interesting background. Hi, Hal. Hi, Cindy. It's great to see you again. It's great to see you again, too. I've had a chance to get to know Hal um, in one because Microsoft serves on our external advisory board. And then we spoke together on a panel for the Northwest Arkansas Tech Summit recently. But let me tell you all about Hal and then uh, we'll jump right into our discussion. Hal actually is a senior principal researcher at Microsoft Research in New York, where he's a member of the Fairness, Accountability, Transparency, and Ethics Group as well as the machine learning and reinforcement learning groups. Now, in addition to that, Hal has a a second life. (laughs) He is also uh, the Parada Chaired Professor of Computer Science and Language Science at the University of Maryland in College Park. And in that role, he's authored over 150 peer-reviewed papers, several of of which have received uh, awards. And so, you know, Hal, wow. Thank you for being with us today, and I would love it if you could just share with the audience a little bit about how you got to where you are doing both of these roles and what got you interested in tech ethics. Sure. Um, So maybe just a little bit of background. So when I first started doing research, I was basically doing natural language processing stuff. So basically getting computers to interact with people using human language in a, a natural way. And my interest sort of slowly shifted around various parts of AI, like uh, parts of machine learning and reinforcement learning. And at some point, it kind of became clear to me that we now have the ability to build a bunch of really complicated and potentially really beneficial technologies. Right. But we're not always doing that. And sometimes we might think we are, but they have unintended consequences and so on. And so my interest in sort of the tech ethics and fairness bias and all those sorts of spaces is basically around this question of how do we ensure that the technology that we build, especially like AI based technology is really, you know, moving the needle forward in terms Mm. of, you know, building a better world right. rather than, you know, reinforcing existing social problems. Right. Um, and so I think as we see AI technology coming into more and more parts of our lives, this is just becoming more and more important. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. And it, it, I'm sure we'll get into this more in our conversation, but it kind of feels like, you know, we launched all this technology and everybody was like, yay, yay, yay. And, and now we're starting to say, oh, well, maybe wait a minute, you know? Uh, And so we can, we'll have a chance to talk about how we can maybe rejigger that whole process a bit and and do it differently going forward. But Microsoft, I love the fact that you talked about wanting to build a better world and and doing that in the right way. And I know Microsoft um, uh, has a set of AI principles, in fact, for responsible AI. Can you tell us a little bit about what those principles are? Sure. So this is something that's actually gone through a few iterations at this point, as such things do. But the the current version is there's six responsible AI principles. Uh, So I'll I'll list them and then say a little bit about them. But I'm happy to, you know, I think later we'll talk about examples of how these things come up in practice. But so uh, the six are fairness, inclusiveness, reliability and safety, transparency, privacy and security, and accountability. Okay. A lot of this is built on, you know, Microsoft's current corporate mission statement is to, okay, I can't get it exactly right. It was basically to empower people everywhere. And so right. a lot of this is sort of coming from that position. So, you know, mm-hmm. if you want to empower people, you need to treat them fairly. You need to empower everyone, not just some people, not just, you know, the people who already have lots of power and society. You need to do this in a way that, you know, people can rely on and doesn't break things. People should be able to understand what these systems are doing. Microsoft, unlike a lot of other companies that people interact with daily, is much more sort of like business to business. We're, we have less of a sort of direct engagement with people, right? We don't really have like a social media site and things like that. Uh-huh. Um, and so for us, things like security and privacy are super important because right. company to company trust is something that's really hard to get back if you've broken it. Oh, yeah. Um, and not treating people's data securely is a really good way of breaking trust. Yeah. 
And then the, the last one is accountability, which I think is interesting because it's the one that's not about the system itself, but the way it's phrased is people should be accountable for AI systems. So mm-hmm. it's really putting the onus on the people rather than, you know, basically saying like, oh, the system did something, right? Like at right. the end of the day, the buck doesn't stop with the system. The buck stops with a person somewhere. Right, right. So essentially, it keeps humans at the center, really, of uh, of the technology and making it clear that technology is really here to serve humans, and we have to be accountable for it, not the other way around. That's actually a really powerful statement. Yeah. So, so how can you share with us maybe some examples of of how you see those principles actually playing out at Microsoft? I think it's one thing to have them on a piece of paper. You know, I mean, today's what the 20 year anniversary of Enron, I think it is. And they had lots of things on the piece of paper, too. But how do you actually see that? We know they all crashed. How do you see that coming to life um, at Microsoft? How is it real? Yeah. So, you know, I've been involved in a handful of projects where various aspects of these different pieces have come up. For instance, on the topic of inclusiveness. So one place where this came up recently was there was a study out of Stanford that looked at a bunch of different automatic speech recognition systems from, I think, like five major technology companies, including Microsoft, and found that they underperformed when transcribing the speech of African-Americans in comparison to white Americans. Americans. This violates the inclusiveness principle. So, yeah. you know, this is a technology now that is only empowering some people, um, right. and not empowering others. The sort of immediate question was, what do we do about this? And, and not just what do we do about this specific problem, like the specific problem that it, the system doesn't appear to work as well for African Americans as for white Americans, but just acknowledging the fact that there's different ways of speaking English even in the United States. Mm -hmm. And if we want something that's inclusive, we don't want to just fix the disparities um, for Black Americans, but actually try to come up with a solution that's really going to be much broader than that. So this led into a lot of discussion about dialects and sociolects. So dialects tend to be geographically constrained ways of speaking somewhat differently. So I went to college in Pittsburgh. People in Pittsburgh say yins uh, (laughs) instead of y'all. Uh, <laughs> and here in the South, we tend to say y'all. <laughs> tend to say y'all. Um, and uh, so, so that's sort of a dialectal difference. There's also socioelectoral differences. So these are things that are not constrained by, ge- by geography, but by some other social aspect. So, you know, if you look at, for instance, like socioeconomic status, right? People at different levels of socioeconomic status might speak English differently. They don't speak English better or worse. Right. Like, it's just different. Different. Um, So this study basically led to a big introspection of, okay, if we're thinking about the U.S. specifically, what are the major dialectal variations? What are the major socioelectral variations? How can we collect data that covers these in like an ethical way? And then, of course, Microsoft's also an international company. So what does this mean when we're talking about English internationally? What does it mean when we're talking about other languages, right? There's Sociolects and dialects of German, sociolects and dialects of Mandarin. So it becomes a big issue, doesn't it? All of a sudden. Yeah. It does. And so it's it's hard, right? I know something about how these things work in the US. I mean, I'm I'm certainly not an expert, um, but I have no idea how these things work in Germany or or even the UK. So this has created basically a large internal push to, you know, engage first linguists in various parts of the world where they will have insight into like, what are the types of variation that you're likely to come across there? Got it. And working to, um, you know, do data collection, both for evaluation and also for like building models in the first Mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a really great example. I mean, it was, you know, it was a a point of, it sounds like introspection that's still playing out because all of a sudden the, the, to your point, the recognition became, well, we shouldn't just put a band-aid on it and solve for that one issue. Like we need to look holistically at the whole issue and we're a global company. How do we step back and do that? So yeah, that's, that's a great example. So, so let me ask you another question. I know you're part of the research group that is um, responsible for ethics and transparency and responsible AI. And in some respects, you, you, you may say at times, or Microsoft may, I, I, I'm not sure, but you know, responsible AI is everyone's job, um, which is great to say, but I've also been in the corporate world for many years, and I know that sometimes when it is said that way and, and, and understood that it's everyone's job, it can almost feel like it's no one's job, right? Like, who's on point for that? Okay, we're all responsible for it, but 
Like who's on point? So how does how does Microsoft um, deal with that issue? Yeah. So not surprisingly, this is also something we've gone through iterations on. Yeah. Um, one quick comment first. We had this paper a couple of years ago um, studying the way that people in industry, not just at Microsoft, but across a large number of companies, including startups and and big major tech companies, deal with fairness related issues or or sort of AI ethics issues. And Uh one of the things that we found in a lot of the interviews we did was that a lot of times these issues are dealt with by one particularly caring person. There's just someone on the team who's decided that this is important to them. And so they basically spend their nights and weekends trying to address AI ethics issues, Uh but like they don't get promoted for it. It's like not part of their day job. Mm -hmm. So so one one person we interviewed referred to these people as fairness vigilantes, um, which is maybe not the best term, but... (laughs) Uh, I, I think this notion that like they're really kind of acting on their own against a system that's maybe not supporting this directly was a problem. We also saw that it often happened that there was misunderstanding about whose job it was. Yeah. So we had cases where we interviewed people on the same team, but mm-hmm. at different levels. So mm-hmm. like a data scientist and a manager, for instance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And like a product manager. Yeah. Okay. And the data scientists would say like, oh, the product manager is worrying about these things. The product manager would say, oh, the data scientist is worrying about these things. <laughs> and like, right? we really wanted to tell them like, you should talk, but we couldn't because like confidentiality and sure. stuff like that. Sure. So anyway, one of the things we've recently tried, which seems to be working like, better than things we've tried in the past is to have people on teams whose specific job it is to worry about these sorts of issues. So there's actually a couple of parallel, not quite parallel, but a couple of related organizations within Microsoft. So there's the Fate Research Group, which is really focused on research, which is where uh-huh. I go. There's Ether, which is uh, this basically AI ethics cross-cutting thing across the company, which includes researchers, so I'm involved with that, as well as people from the the legal team, um, people from HR, data scientists, engineers, and so on. Um, And then there's the third sort of cross-cutting organization that's much more like the data scientist engineer level. All of these are basically trying to provide scaffolding so that these individual people on each team whose job it is to think about ethics have a pool of resources that they can go to it's like they probably don't know everything right and so sure, right um a lot of what i find myself doing in my sort of ether time <laughs> is consulting with uh these people whose job it is to sort of monitor ai ah. ethics stuff on teams and mm-hmm. you know i mean like i gave the example of like you know how do we find linguists who know about sociolex and dialects, right? Maybe an engineer on a team doesn't know how to do that or doesn't have the right connections, but like right. maybe one of us does. Right, um, right. And so th- that's that's been the structure we've had. And it's not perfect. There's certainly yeah. things that go wrong, but it seems to be working better than anything we've tried before. Yeah. And what I like about that, that just sort of hearing you talk about it is I hope it helps everyone understand this is a journey. I mean, it's not like a one and done and you get it right. It's iterative and you learn as you go and you improve the processes as you go along. Um, and this, you know, this seems to be working now. And if I talk to you a year later, the maybe another iteration on it, but, yeah. um, but it sounds like it's working better, you know, than it was uh, before. And, you know, it's not uncommon what you described that if you don't, if a company doesn't specifically and explicitly talk about whose responsibility something is, then everyone thinks it belongs to somebody else, right? Yeah. And that's how 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 we can all as and when you're working in a company, a company can get into trouble because nobody really fully understands whose job it is. So it's good the to see the thing we've been trying on. to do with sort of mixed success is, is um, provide tooling support for ah. the people whose job it is to do this. So I wasn't involved in this, but there was a research project a couple of years ago, two years ago, maybe now on quote, fairness checklists, Mm -hmm. um, which is basically, you know, things you should think about throughout the full 
development of an AI system. Mm. It's, it's not meant to be a checklist, right? Checklists sometimes get a bad rap right, for yeah, reasonable right. reasons because it's like yeah. you do what you have to do to check the box sure. and then you move on. Right. Um, but the, the, the checks are less about, you know, did you, you know, insert this line of code or something, but much more about, did you think about X, Y, Z potential implication? Right, right, right. It's sort of a framework for things that, you know, as opposed to a checklist that they should be thinking about. That's uh, yeah, that's a good tool. That's a really good tool. It's a guide, right? Yeah. yeah and not everything is applicable everywhere, but sure. it's, it's trying to be, um, you know, ether has been around, I'll probably get the dates wrong, but I'm going to say like five years or something like that. And, you know, we've been involved in a fair number of projects through that time. And sure, every project has its unique things that make it challenging, but there's a lot that happens that you see over and over again. And so yeah. if you can at least streamline those over and over again occurrences, then you can use the other resources like reaching out to Ether or reaching out to the faith mm -hmm. group or something as a way of trying to address the things that are like really specific to your problem. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Well, let's switch gears here for a minute and talk a little bit about machine learning specifically. And and in this audience for, for this conversation, hell, not everyone is going to be a data scientist or an engineer and may not even understand what machine learning is. So can you just in a, in a few words, just explain it very simply? What, what actually is machine learning? Sure. I think of it as programming by example. So you want to write a program, you don't know how to write it but you can come up with examples of desired inputs and out and their corresponding outputs. Mm -hmm. um, so you take a lot of those and you feed it into some machine learning algorithm and it essentially writes your program for you. Now, garbage in, garbage out is a thing. And so, you know, you don't give it good examples, it's gonna learn something not so good. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really about, you know, trying to develop tools by, providing examples of desired behavior rather than, um, you know, coding the behavior yourself. Okay. So the, uh, an algorithm actually, like you said, writes, it, it writes it, the machine writes it. You just tell them the inputs and the outputs and you don't do the coding. So, so then with that explanation, can you, can you help us understand how do the sort of the AI machine, uh, responsible AI principles play out in the machine learning kind of life cycle. I'm sure there's a process for that. So how, how does all that work together? Yeah. So there's lots of ways of thinking about the machine learning life cycle. I mean, we have one that we reuse a lot. So, you know, I, I sort of said it in an easy way, right? Like, oh, all you do is provide input yeah. output examples and then like magic happens. Yeah. It sounds like I can just go do that. <laughs> yeah, you could, right. And then, um, you know, you run the risk of terrible things happening in the world. Right. So, um, <laughs> So yeah, so, so generally we think about this through sort of eight stages. So the first is, you know, just like in any engineering project, you have to define the task that you want to solve. This often involves collecting input from various stakeholders, right? This is basically a design problem. Yeah. So like anything you might do in design um, can go into defining the task, right? So like going back to the principles, right? So like one of the principles is um, inclusive inclusiveness. And so, you know, if you want your technology or your system to work for a broad range of people, it might be worth getting their input at sort of the design phase. Yeah, got it. So then, uh, okay, you need to get these input and output examples somewhere, right? So mm -hmm. this is now where you start collecting and possibly annotating data. Um, so uh, the way I, I think that, you know, the standard way people think of sort of uh, responsible AI stuff coming in the, the collecting and annotating data is basically making sure that your data is as representative of how you want your system to behave as possible. Um, so there was like an old now story about how, I can't even remember what car manufacturer it was, but they had a voice recognition system in their car and it worked really well when men talked to it and not so well when women talked oh. to it, right? And mm -hmm. why? Well, it's because apparently the way that a lot of this data was collected was it was in computer science labs. They had people in the labs record themselves. Turns out lots of people in computer science labs are men. Mm -hmm. um, and so they had ended up collecting a lot more data from men than from women. And so uh -huh. the system learned 
to do a better job on men than women because that's what it was shown how to do. Right. Um, so, uh, so the collection and annotating data really is going to drive a lot of um, like how well a system is going to generalize across populations. And so you often see people pointing at the data as if the data is sort of the main or only cause of sure, potential yeah. issues. Yeah. And certainly it has a role to play, uh-huh. but like in this example of like data collected in computer science labs, the data is that way because of social conditions that led to a world in which there are more men than women in computer science labs, right? So like the data is a reflection of something in the world. Right. Or I guess another example of this was there's a high profile case of, you know, big tech company that built a system to do like automated resume filtering and it basically filtered out all women. Yeah, right. Um, And this, again, it's the same sort of thing. It's like, it was trained on data that was like biased by historical hiring processes. And so it's kind of no surprise that it's going to like replicate these biased historical hiring processes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, I mean, it really does put a fine point on, yes, this may be an engineering process and an, uh, and an engineering project, but it isn't just engineers again who need to be involved in that because you've got to, you got to, to your point, thinking back just to the data, isn't going to always be the answer. You've got to look, look broader than that. Think about kind of where do you go get the data set and, and others who aren't necessarily engineers can help, um, you know, two minds that are different are going to be a diverse team, going to be better than one and thinking about where do we need to go to get the right data set so that we don't end up with, you know, cars that only understand men and not women as well, right? Yeah. So, okay. So we've got our, we have our task, we have our data. So now we yep. need to find a machine learning model, which is basically going to be like, what is the structure of the thing that's going to map from the inputs to the outputs? Got it. I, I think maybe in terms of the responsible AI principles, the biggest thing that comes up here is really around transparency. Mm. So a lot of people are using deep neural nets to do everything these days because they're pretty effective at a lot of stuff when you have lots of data and lots of compute, but they're really hard to understand what they're doing. Mm. It's, you know, it's basically this giant sequence of matrix multiplications that goes on for like ages. And, you know, your system makes some bad decision at the end. It's really hard to say like what went wrong in the, yeah. in the middle. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, so there's some work uh, in research on trying to make um, deep neural networks more explainable. But if you go talk to Cynthia Rudin, who's... Um, uh, a professor who's like done a bunch of really good work in this space. I mean, her attitude is basically if you're building a model for a high stakes setting, you should be using something that you can understand directly. Mm-hmm. So like mm-hmm. decision trees or decision lists are the sorts of things that she's often advocating for. Interesting. Yeah. So th- there's big choices there about like, yeah. you know, how important is it that this thing is understandable right. to, um, to people who are looking at it? Yeah. Um, okay, so then you train the model on the data that you have. You'll then do some like testing usually, mm-hmm. and then uh, some sort of deployment of the system, and then either sort of like direct feedback, right? Like some user complains that your system doesn't work, or maybe the New York Times writes an article <laughs> that your system is terrible, um, or or more implicit things, right? So like lots of systems these days collect like click through. Um, what's the word, like the click, click the throughs click. Or, or reading times or stuff like that, right? So there's, right, there's right, right. Yeah, yeah. And then adjusting and monitoring and tinkering as you go along the way. So yeah, yeah. so let's come back to what we, what we touched on at the beginning of our conversation. I'm going to ask you a question about um, uh, how to maybe avoid this, oh no, we should have done it differently, you know? <laughs> We're never going to be perfect, but I wonder if there is, some economic incentive, perhaps, um, for companies to get it right, uh, or mostly right um, at the beginning before it's released. And 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 when I say that, I'm thinking about um, some studies that I've seen and that you and I've talked about before about accessibility and how, you know, in that context, uh, when problems were found after things had been rolled out. I think it was almost double the cost of the project to get it right, but it was exponentially lower, like less than 5% of the cost if you just do it right at the beginning. Do you think the same thing applies here? Is there something to be learned in this machine learning life cycle from this accessibility example that would be an economic incentive to companies? Yeah, I mean, 
I really want someone to do that study. I definitely suspect that this is true. Like my experience is that the more you can think about at the level of designing the task even and and the initial data collection, the easier it is to move forward. Yeah. And this is hard because, you know, I think a lot of times we have this sort of attitude of, you know, like build a minimal viable product. Um, and, right. The MVP. Um, <laughs> yeah. And that's not necessarily an avenue that leads to the most reflection. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but, but at the same time, what you often see in practice is that when things go wrong, it's so hard to fix them like from the beginning that um, people tend to apply sort of like bandage solutions. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so this also came up in the study we did a couple of years ago where you basically see, and, and there's a couple of reasons for this. So probably the most famous example that I know of in this case was um, this case where there was a image captioning or image categorization tool that labeled a photo of a bunch of African-American people as gorillas. And um, uh, I mean, this made like pretty big press and, um, you know, is obviously offensive, especially because of Very um, historic prejudices sure. like around Absolutely. like exactly this topic. Yep. Um, and the solution that was employed at the time was just to prevent the model from outputting gorilla on any image, mm. um, right? Which certainly fixes this problem. Um, but, you know, it doesn't get at the root of the problem. Right. And it also prevents you from being able to use this thing on, you know, photos you take at the zoo or something where you're actually taking a photo of a gorilla. Yeah. Um, and so, so you see this a lot. And part of it is because, like, you need a quick fix, right? Like, that part's right. totally understandable. Oh, yeah. And the second is one thing that's complicated about machine learning systems is that you know, if you tweak part of the model over here, uh -huh. it's often very unclear how it's going to affect things um, over here. Uh, and so there's a fear that if I actually try to address this at like a root cause level, it's going to break a bunch of other stuff that is hard for me to detect. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think this is also why it's really important to try to do these try to spend a lot of time at the beginning in terms of like defining and collecting data and stuff like that, because it prevents you from getting into this position where you're terrified of changing anything because you don't know what it's like adverse right. impacts are going to be. Yeah. Yeah. So it's almost thinking about it in a way that to go fast, you all, we almost need to slow down, right? A little bit at the beginning, because that will allow us to go further faster <laughs> than just an MVP that may get you, you know, 10 yards down the road, down the, down the, down the field, if you will, but not hundred yards. And if you want to, you know, get that touchdown and make it sustainable wins, then the more time you spend up, up front thinking about it, right. With a diverse set of individuals could actually help you go further faster. Than yeah, I think so. And, and it's I really a real, do... there's a real tension there though. Cause with technology, you know, companies, you got to go fast. So yeah, you got to go fast. Yeah. I, mean, I think there's, um, I mean, I, I think like you were saying at the beginning, the economic incentive, right? So yeah. this accessibility study that's like, you know, designing accessibility from the start is like one or 2% of the cost and, you know, doing it at the end. I can't remember the exact number, but I, I do remember that it often ends up in like two to three times as many lines mm -hmm. of code to try yeah. to like tack accessible accessibility features on mm -hmm. to the system that already exists. Yeah. And I, I'm, I don't know, you know, I, I hate, prognosticating because like I'm probably going to be wrong but like I'm pretty sure something is similar for AI okay. ethics issues right so like if you you know even if all you care about is sort of like bottom line yeah um, you know I think there's an argument that it's much better to address these things up front than to address yeah. them later yeah great great research project there right for yeah, the someone should do <laughs> it I, I professor. To send me a copy of the, the report that's right. That's right. So I, I thought of one other um, sort of outside the tech industry example that I wonder what you think about the viability of using it within the tech industry um, would be. So, you know, again, you're talking about getting at root cause. 
what, what causes um, mistakes, you could almost say what causes accidents to happen, which kind of brings to my mind, you know, in the transportation industry, which obviously is very highly regulated. So that's, that's one ch- difference right there. But, you know, when a plane crashes or there's a, you know, a, a bad crash on the, the highways, there's, um, you know, at first an airplane, they recover the black box and they do like a root cause analysis and do a big investigation into it. Um, and it's, you know, it's broadly shared, right? So the industry as a whole can learn from that and, and hopefully not have, you know, root cause mistakes happen again. Is there anything like that, that the industry shares um, on the tech side in terms of root cause of problems, or would that be beneficial or how would that even work in a not highly regulated industry like transportation? Yeah. Um, I think there's, I mean, I think there's a couple of answers. So um, I mean, I'm reminded most of like Ben Schneiderman had this article maybe a year ago or something where he was drawing this parallel between sort of algorithmic reliability and, um, and aviation reliability. And um, he talks about three things that aviation monitoring does. Um, so there's, there's sort of continual monitoring of systems. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, or you could think about, you know, the FDA is constantly checking to see if there's like salmonella in your spinach. Right. Or something, yeah, right? that's true. Right. Yeah. Um, Food safety. And, and that's sort of like proactive. Right. And then on, on the other side, there's like what you're saying, basically, when things go wrong, when a plane crashes, it's pretty obvious that something went wrong. Um, it's right. actually a lot less clear for a lot of these systems, right? So, you know, I, yeah. I gave examples of speech recognition. I gave examples of the, the image captioning. Um, there's, you know, facial recognition, examples, like yeah. facial recognition, not yeah. working for people with dark skin, um, CEO search image results, returning all like, you know, mid forties, white men photos, right? Like, right? And all of these have been, uh, uncovered either by investigative journalists or by researchers, Mm -hmm. as far as I know. I'll qualify that slightly, but the majority of them are found this way. Right. And so I think that there's first a detection problem that's Mm -hmm. uh, maybe a little bit more, maybe it's more analogous to the FDA case where you have to detect the salmonella. It's not the salmonella jumps out and says, I am salmonella. That's right. Yeah. And so I think where the field is right now is we've spent a lot of time thinking about monitoring, at least self-monitoring. We haven't thought much about, or we haven't, we haven't made much progress on sort of third party monitoring, like Mm. you might have in a regulatory system. Right. I don't think we're actually that far on thinking about, you know, sort of the equivalent of the the airplane black box. Mm -hmm. Um, When things go wrong, we don't really have that many tools at our disposal to try to understand why. Mm. Um, so, so there's been, like I hinted at this before, but there's been a, been a bunch of work on sort of explaining machine learning systems behavior. Mm-hmm. And a lot of this is with the aim of debugging, which is essentially, you know, if something goes wrong, we'd like to debug what went wrong. Yes. There's also been, a fair amount of work on trying to ascribe errors to aspects of the data on which the system was trained. So you might want to say something like, okay, this system, you know, made this error because, uh, you know, these five training examples led it to think X, Y, Z. And so then you can ask questions like, should I remove those training examples where they like, are they incorrect? Should I get right. more stuff like that? But to be totally honest, like we don't really have good ways of doing this. And I, I think this is one of the reasons why you see a lot of calls for regulation of various mm-hmm. parts of like automated decision-making industry. You see a lot of sort of like anti-facial recognition um, mm-hmm. bans in various states and countries. Um, I think New York is implementing uh, something about using automated decision-making for hiring. Mm-hmm. Um, for a lot of these things, there's a big gap between, like in order to regulate something, you have to be able to measure it. And right. to measure it, you have to be able to audit it. And I think right. it's just not there. Not yet. And so like, while I'm very sympathetic to a lot of the calls for regulation, like I, I think this makes a lot of sense. Um, 
it's hard to imagine exactly what those what, what the what sort of regulations would actually move the needle. Um, but anyway, that's my personal opinion. I'm definitely not speaking for Microsoft when I say that. So Hal, I, uh, you're teaching at the University of Maryland, I think a new class this semester about machine learning and, and ethics. You know, what are the kind of one or two big takeaways that you've, you've gotten as you, as we're recording this, we're near the end of the semester. So I'm curious how that course has gone and uh, what you kind of learned from this first semester. Um, I guess the first thing I learned is I think students were really happy to be back in person. Yeah, um, I know. <laughs> I think, uh, I mean, everyone was like super engaged and it, it was a lot of fun to teach this class. I think there were a couple of things. I mean, it, it was, the class was weird in the sense that it was a computer science class where probably half of the stuff we read was political philosophy, <laughs> which a lot of students found challenging. We also had a bunch of students from other departments, from philosophy or sociology or psychology and the information school. So, so that was helpful. You know, I think the, to me, the biggest thing is that there's this gap between the way that, you know, a lot of sort of ethics philosophy thinks about problems and what actually happens on the ground. Yeah. I don't want to pick on like the trolley problem too much, but ethicists love to talk about the trolley problem. That's just not the problem that we actually face. Um, I, I guess one of the places where we found the most leverage in terms of like actually really connecting uh-huh. sort of like ethical principles with things on the ground is like literature from science and technology studies. So mm-hmm. now this is a literature, at least the part of it that we're looking at is like basically technical critique. Um, so, so people like Anna Lauren Hoffman, for instance, has done a bunch of amazing work in this space. Um, you know, sort of looking at the social implications of a lot of technology. Yeah. And that, I, I more... think this is what we need. Like we need no. to, there was this joke we had when I was in grad school. So I mentioned that like, I didn't start as a machine learning person. I started doing right. language and uh-huh. we, we kind of joked about machine learning that like in machine learning, it's like God gives you a matrix and your job is to do something with this matrix. <laughs> Um, and, uh, really what this means to me now is that the starting place for a lot of machine learning work is I have some data, but it's been completely decontextualized. Mm. And, um, and so, so we've moved ourselves from like thinking about like socio-technical problems and how systems interact with society, right. to purely technical problems. Oh. And that abstraction has been really useful in pushing a lot of machine learning research forward. Mm-hmm. But what we're seeing is that if you only use that abstraction, once the thing you build hits the real world, right? Like, ugh, like bad things. Right, happen. right, right, right. So it's bringing that abstraction back to reality, but with some practical critiques of, yeah. of systems. As a, so to, to fill that gap um, between just talking about philosophy, if you will, and ethics philosophy, which doesn't end up being very practical and useful at times, to how do I get out of this abstract, you know, problem of machine learning where I think I've fixed it? There's there's a huge gap between those two, right? Yeah. yeah. So filling that with um, with critiques that are relevant and practical. Um, I think is a is a great way to go. Well, congratulations to you on um, teaching that course the first time. Thank you for your time with us today, Hal. This has just been a wonderful conversation. Um, thank you for all the work you're doing at Microsoft as well. I always like to ask my guests one last question before they go. Are there, in addition to all the resources you've mentioned already, is there anything else if a student or somebody else who's listening, um, an executive wants to learn more about this topic that you could recommend to them either in terms of a book or, or maybe a documentary or a, a podcast series? Oh, it's so hard to just pick one. Uh, well, you don't uh, have to. You can give two or three. <laughs> I mean, I think, um, you know, if I had to say one place to go, I would check out... Um, 
a lot of the reports put out by the AI Now Institute. Um, so I, they've done a lot of really great work at, on, on sort of like in this like socio-technical space of understanding okay. like the real world impact of AI systems. Okay. Um, uh, and, and they have a number of, you know, relatively short documents on right. a wide range of topics that are really right. good. Good. Um, you know, I also really liked the movie Coded Bias. This is largely about Joy Rulamini um, and her efforts to rein in facial recognition technology and all of yeah. its ways. It's not just about her. It also has sort of vignettes from like almost, you know, sort of the who's who in this space. So yeah. any of the people featured in that movie is like a good person to go check out their book. And then maybe that's a great one. I've watched that one. It is, it, it's, it's very engaging. It's really um, for good. A documentary. Yeah. And she's I, a student at MIT. It's great. Yeah. And then maybe the, the third thing I would say is I really liked Ruha Benjamin's book, Race After Technology. Um, okay. It's a, it's a pretty accessible read. It's very recent. It's like in the past year, I think she brings a, a bunch of interesting perspectives that um, are sort of easy to understand once they've been written down in a way yeah. that's easy to understand, yeah. um, but uh, but also sort of deep in their implications. Yeah, yeah. Oh, those are great recommendations, Hal. Thank you. And thank you so much again for your time today. This has been a, a, just a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Cindy. My pleasure. All right. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye.